Uh, tonight's lecturer is uh, Monmouth University's Professor of English Literature, Dr. Stanley Blair, who gave a wonderful presentation last year on Henry Morford of Middletown, where he brought to light a good deal of new information and made some really interesting original connections. So I'm going to add historian to your title as well. I hope you don't mind that, Dr. Blair. Is that okay with you? No, I'm honored. Thank you. Okay. Historian and professor, Dr. Blair. So if you missed that lecture and you'd like to see it, you can find it on our YouTube channel accessible through our website. So without further ado, please welcome tonight's Dr. Stanley Blair. Thank you, Dana. Uh, let's see. I have an alternate title for you that's a little bit less exciting, but more descriptive, which is Welcome to Wanalasset, New Jersey, Margaret Whitmer's North Asbury Park and Wanamasa Ocean Township, circa 1901 to 1915. Uh, Wanalasset is a fictional place, but North Asbury Park and Wanamasa are real places. Uh, to begin, I have an epigraph, which my American literature students know is a quotation at the beginning of a document. Uh, so the quotation is, uh, is this, Auntie, I never knew there was so much niceness in the world, really, she said. I thought it was only in the storybooks. It's right here, darling, said Rosamond. The epigraph is drawn from Margaret Whitmer's 1915 novel, Why Not? our main focus this evening. In the scene, a little girl named Alicia Loretta, called Allie, reflects on the difficulty she had growing up as an orphan. Allie is delighted to know that she will be taken care of by her new foster aunt and soon to be foster mother, Rosamond Gilbert, the novel's protagonist or main character. Allie speaks to Rosamond and Rosamond replies. The moment could be described as metafictional, fiction about fiction, and self-referential, that is to say, about itself. You and I, dear audience, are in the real world, examining an excerpt from a novel. Within that novel, Allie contrasts her real-world experience of being an orphan and the niceness of the fictional world of storybooks, suggesting that the real world and the fictional world are totally different places. Rosamond replies that this is not the case, that the niceness of the fictional world is also in the real world. However, Rosamond is saying this as a fictional character within the fictional world of a novel, which is another kind of storybook. This brings us back to Ali's distinction between the fictional storybooks and the real world and Rosamond's dissolving of that difference and so on. So this passage poses something of a dilemma. Should we agree with Allie that the real world and fictional storybooks are totally different? Or should we agree with Rosamond that at least some elements of fictional storybooks are also in the real world? This presentation agrees with Rosamond, specifically that some elements of Whitmer's novel are also in local history. My remarks this evening are in four parts. The realizer of dreams, the dream lady, upside down and backwards, and speculations. 
Part one, the realizer of dreams, the author and the novel. While most of you can readily access information about Margaret Whitmer, a few biographical details may be helpful. She is perhaps best known as the co-winner of the 1919 forerunner to the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry for her collection, The Old Road to Paradise. She was born in Doylestown, Pennsylvania and grew up in Asbury Park where local historian Peter Lucia says, the family home was at Grand and Seventh Avenues. Her father, the Reverend Howard Taylor Whitmer, was the pastor of the First Congregational Church. She was homeschooled, but attended and graduated Drexel Institute Library School. She worked for a couple of years as a librarian. She married another poet, Robert Schaffler, in 1919 and later divorced him. Mainly known for her poetry, she was active in the early years of the Poetry Society of America, which enabled her to interact with many other American poets, some now forgotten, others viewed as important. But she wrote and published many novels for adults and also for children, 40 book-length works of fiction for adults between 1915 and 1968, some of which were adapted into silent films, nine books of children's fiction between 1915 and 1939, nine collections of poetry between 1917 and 1958, two books of writing, uh, on writing, and three memoirs in the 1960s. She performed her poetry, was a media personality, and lectured around the country. My own experiences as a reader and teacher of Whitmer's works have been positive. Her 1915 novel, Why Not, our subject this evening, is the first of three books that use a fictionalized version of Asbury Park, The Park, as a setting. The other two books being The Boardwalk, 1920, and Graven Image, 1923. I have taught The Boardwalk in whole and in part in upper level courses on short stories and on modern American literature with considerable student interest. The Boardwalk is a fascinating book that merits a separate talk of its own. Yet despite Margaret Whitmer's consistent, prolific and varied literary output, she seems never to have surpassed her early success. She died in Gloversville, New York at the age of 93. Some of her papers were donated to Syracuse University. At least from what information is available online, she seems to have been omitted from American literature anthologies. Most contemporary readers have never heard of her. My hope is that by attending tonight, you will have heard of her, and maybe you might be willing to look further into her life and works beyond what our brief time together will allow. And so to her novel, Why Not? Now, I cannot tell you the entire story and still have time to talk about why you might read it, but a summary of the basic details of the novel's characters and plot might be helpful. Hold on to your hats. Anne Rosamond Gilbert inherits some of her late great uncle's wealth. She decides on a series of goals, she wants to touch her great uncle's prized ivory elephant, to get a Japanese silk nightgown, to live in a house in the woods near water, to have a Livonian bloodhound, to tell people's fortunes, and to have a knightly, with a K, lover. She decides to make a new start by buying a bungalow near an unnamed summer resort so she can help people to make their dreams real under the guise of being a fortune teller. Rosamond meets three men, John Squire, a wealthy landowner who sells Rosamond her bungalow, Richard Gerald, a recent Yale graduate and underfunded inventor who owns a nearby hotel, and Jim Madison, a fellow recent Yale graduate who owns a country store a few miles away. Rosamond mentors a local orphan named Alicia Loretta, called Allie, who dreams of having a better life. And she also assists a local young woman named Sydney Brown, whose dream is to live life as a man. Later, Rosamond wants to help Sydney by setting her up as a female with a man. 
Throughout the novel, Squire sees Gerald, Madison, and even the cross-dressing Sidney interact with Rosamond, and he assumes that all three are potential rival suitors. Out in the country, the cross-dressed Sidney, called Sid, helps Jim Madison with his store, and they become close friends. She finds him dating the local woman, Modella Roberts, and gets frustrated at him, but can't show it because she's cross-dressed. Uh, Jim arranges a double first date with he and Sidney and two local girls, Emily and Elabel Warren. Meanwhile, near the seaside resort, Rosamond helps Gerald with his hotel and they become attracted to each other, she viewing him as the white knight. Although her cousins try to get her to go back to her great uncle's home, she insists on staying put in Wanalasset. Squire defends her and the two of them draw closer as they care for his ailing housekeeper, Martha Lilly, during which time they leave Allie at the hotel under the care of Sydney's stepmother. Gerald stops by Squire's house, sees Rosamond and Squire together and quickly leaves. Although Rosamond and Squire are romantically attracted to each other, she refuses him. And then St Sydney's stepmother proposes to adopt Allie away from Rosamond. Rosamond seeks out Gerald, who now says he has raised enough money from, his, from the hotel to finance his invention. He acknowledges her relationship with Squire, but wants to remain friends with her. And he advises her that she should give up Allie. Rosamond thinks that she has lost both Squire and Gerald, and maybe Allie also. However, Squire goes to Rosamond. They confess their love for each other. Sydney arrives dressed as a man and requests her female clothes. Squire trusts Rosamond, who helps Sydney dress as a woman again in preparation for Madison's imminent arrival at the bungalow. Rosamond quickly introduces Sydney as a woman to Squire, who happily recognizes her as the man he had seen with Rosamond, the potential rival. Madison arrives and is surprised and then pleased to find that Sydney is a woman. Both couple, couples are reconciled. Rosamond realizes that Squire is her knight figure. Allie has the prospect of foster parents, and as the novel ends, and they lived happily ever, ever after. Why not? Besides the author, many things in the novel might commend it to our attention, especially during Women's History Month. Rosamond Gilbert is a financially independent and empowered woman in 1915, in the middle of the suffrage movement to which she refers. At one point, Richard Gerald even uses the phrase, quote, feminist fairy tale, unquote. Rosamon accomplishes all the goals she set out to achieve at the novel's beginning, and along the way manages to help several people. She helps an orphan girl, Allie, who wants a mother, and she helps Sidney Brown first to pass as a man, and then as a woman to find a romantic relationship with a man. Rosamon also helps three male characters to realize their dreams. By the end of the novel, John Squire is no longer miserably alone. Jim Madison has a good friend as well as a partner, and Richard Gerald is able to fund his invention. The more edgy and direct critique of gender, of course, comes through the relationship between Sidney Brown and Jim Madison and their efforts to operate outside of social restrictions. Sidney's cross-dressing as Sid is inspired by her not wanting to conform to traditional feminine stereotypes. She cross-dresses, even though she and Rosamond know that Sidney's stepmother would disapprove, and even though they know cross-dressing was illegal. Quote, Rosamond remembered acutely that there were such things as laws against the wearing of clothes that make you happiest if they aren't the ones your sex, sex should sport. Unquote. But the novel's critique of gender may extend to matters of sexuality in that Jim Madison confides to Sid, quote, look here, Sid, it's this way. I ought to get married. My people want me to, and I know I should. And well, I told you, I can't get myself focused on a girl. They don't like me. 
Sid tries to object, but Jim continues, quote, but there's something about me girls don't like, and I'm not going to marry any of them because they want, he grinned, a good corner grocery business and a brick house. But we ought to make an effort, you and I. Not liking girls isn't normal at our age, unquote. Later on, Jim says to Sid, quote, I want somebody or other badly, someone who could give me all you could and be a woman too, end quote. Jim is attracted to what he thinks is a male friend, but acknowledges that his family and society expect him to have a woman as a wife. While the novel ends, as earlier sentimental novels did, with feminist characters like Rosamond and Sidney ultimately accepting traditional feminine roles in marriage and family, the rest of the novel raises and sustains some intriguing questions about the relationship between gender and identity. However, what might additionally commend the novel to our attention in Monmouth County is the extent to which Whittemer's novel appears to have fictionalized real life communities near where she grew up. Now, while quote unquote proving that a fictional setting is based on a real location might be satisfying, the discipline of literary studies is more modest and generally does not prove things. It seems more intellectually honest to characterize the goal as being to persuade the audience. Persuasion then depends on accumulating a sufficient amount of circumstantial evidence. Literary evidence from the book itself, biographical evidence about the author, and geographical and historical information about the location. To persuade this circumstantial evidence from within and outside of the book must be sufficient to tilt the balance in the direction of the preponderance of the evidence of what seems not less likely, but more likely. If correlations between fictional and real worlds are sufficiently numerous and persuasive, in effect, one may map the fictional world onto the real one and vice versa. If Whittemer's 1915 books, Fictional Geography of the Wanalasset Area, bears multiple resemblances to the real geography of the Wanamasa area, then perhaps there might be sufficient evidence to persuade that in creating fictional Wanalasset, Whittemer drew upon the real local landscape. In this case, the evidence involves at least 11 resemblances of fictional places in the novel to real ones, of which I'll talk about nine now and the other two later, if you'd like me to. First, Rosemont inherits from her late great uncle Alvin $3,000 and his house where she was raised. She seems to associate the house with bad childhood memories of him never nurturing her dreams. As a result of this, she makes three changes. She drops her first name, Anne, and goes by her middle name, Rosamond. Etymologically, the name Rosamond evokes the idea of a rosy, rose-colored, or optimistic world. Her second change is her goal in life. She wants to use her inheritance to realize her own dreams and to help others realize theirs as what she calls a professional dream realizer, her cover for which is pretending to be a fortune teller. More important for our purposes, to go along with the name change and the life goal change, Rosamond decides to get away from her uncle's house, which she eventually rents out, and to move to a new home in a new town that is optimistic and positive as her new name and her new life goals. Prior to the novel's beginning, Rosamond seems already to have given considerable thought to her wonderful new home. The narrator says that recently she had devoured a booklet that she has in hand. Rosamond says she has received a letter from a real estate agent. Later, the narrator tells us that Rosamond and the agent have spoken by telephone long distance. Initially undecided between renting and buying, Rosamond decides to buy the bungalow for two of her $3,000. 
Rosamond gradually reveals to her cousin Jenny increasingly specific details about the location of her new home. I want a Japanese silk nightgown and a house off in the woods somewhere, on the edge of the woods near the water, you know, Rosamond says. The word water is, of course, ambiguous as to the kind of body of water. Linking her new name and her new home, Rosamond specifies in which village it is located. Quote, I should feel much prettier, I'm sure, and more ornamental some way, just Rosamond. So please address my letters that way to Juana Lasset, unquote. When Jenny presses Rosamond on whether she has chosen a home there, Rosamond clarifies and says, quote, I have. Yes, um, I have. Juana Lasset, New Jersey. No mosquitoes. I don't in the least believe that. And a dear little concrete bungalow that cuddles between the woods and the lake just the way I want it. Now, if you are able to see the map in the upper right-hand corner, you will see a triangular peninsula. Uh, that's Wanamasa, New Jersey, uh, the real place. Point two, how does Rosamond get from her uncle's home in East Warren to Wanalasset, and in what direction did she travel to get there? The narrator says that Rosamond travels there partly by train and that she's done so more than once. When she's on the train, the narrator offers no description of what direction she's traveling. But in a later passage set in Wanalasset, Rosamond suggests to Sydney that she, quote unquote, run up to New York City. If up means north, then Wanalasset is south of New York City. Rosamond's train does not go to Wanalasset, although on one occasion, the conductor calls out that name as the train arrives. Instead, the station where the trains came in uh, is, quote, a summer resort that avenged itself for having to be neat and pretty near the ocean by being as ugly as it could where the trains came in. There are two parts to this resort town, the part near the ocean and the part near the train tracks. Rosamond might be familiar with the neat and pretty oceanfront part of this particular summer resort, not only because she's taken this train more than once, but also because earlier she said that she wants to tell fortunes for a living, uh, but not in a wrapper like the ones on boardwalks. This summer resort has a boardwalk. A character also mentions later that, quote unquote, some brute from the boardwalk once tried to buy the same bungalow and convert it to an ice cream stand. So, Juana Lasset is located near a summer resort that is near the ocean and that has a boardwalk. Around the turn of the last century, this could be several places. However, very few of them had a neat side and an ugly side. In most cases, trains arrived at stations near business or entertainment districts, especially tourists from the north, because they would be likely to want to go there. A partial exception to this was Asbury Park. True, the main Asbury Park train station near Main Street and Madison Avenue is adjacent to the city shopping area. However, by train coming from the north, more or less along what would have been the New York and Long Branch Railroad, but is now the New Jersey Transit's North, north Coast Line, the narrator's description, quote unquote, where the trains come in to Asbury Park would have been the former North Asbury Park train station near the corner of Memorial Drive and Sunset Avenue. On the map, you may faintly be able to make out North Asbury Park Railroad Station. Unlike the main Asbury Park station, the North Asbury station was located in a less touristy, and even back then as older maps show, more industrial area. The North Asbury Park train station was also the station closest to where Margaret Whittemer grew up, a few blocks walk from her home. Ironically, about this area, Rosamond says, quote, thank goodness I don't live here, unquote. Point three, within sight distance of this station in the novel is the real estate agent's office indicated by a sign. The narrator does not give us the direction from the station to the office. However, 
if the station is the North Asbury train station, the real estate office may be that of Albert Rob Robbins, a realtor who in 1915 had three offices in Asbury Park, North Asbury Park, and Allenhurst, all three of them located across from those train stations. The approximate location of Robbins's North Asbury off office, just northwest of the intersection of Main and Sunset, is now occupied by a Dunkin' Donuts. Four, in turn, from the real estate agent's office, the bungalow can be reached by carriage or motor car. Rosamond opts for the motor car, a Rolls Royce driven by who she thinks is the agent, but is actually the bungalow's owner, who she later calls the squire, and who by coincidence is actually named John Squire. The Rolls Royce is a clue to the novel's chronological setting. The Rolls Royce Company was founded in 1906. So the Squire is driving a Rolls between then, 1906, and the year of the novel's publication, 1915. Rosamond and the Squire stop nearby to pick up a cot for Rosamond, quote unquote. Uh, the cot is waiting for me in the store at the next corner, she says. In what direction the next corner is, the narrator does not say but that there is a next corner implies a street grid. Rosamond's location is important because a precise direction and distance from this point helps one to locate fictional Wanalasset. On the train, Rosamond mentions to herself that, quote, the summer resort is a little way from my bungalow. However, the squire specifies how far away and in what direction. As he drives from the cot store, he tells Rosamond, the bungalow's west of us about a mile and a half. Since the bungalow is in Wanalasset, Wanalasset itself is located a short distance west of the train station. You can see the train station at the bottom. The road to the right is Sunset Avenue. If you uh, proceed on it towards the top of the screen, which is west, you'll see it crosses a lake and it goes into Wanamasa. Five, where in Wanalasa the bungalow is, is more challenging to determine. The squire mentions to Rosamond that he constructed the bungalow two years earlier, a half mile from his own bungalow. His home appears to be further east and her bungalow further west, but there is a little path through the wood between the two, and both seem to be on the same lake within sight distance of each other. Later in the novel, when she is settled, she sometimes looks out the window to see people canoeing on the lake, and she goes canoeing. It is also possible to take a motorboat across the lake. The motorboat apparently rides in a circuit every half hour and stops at docks on demand en route to a landing near a trolley station. Rosamond's bungalow uses the third dock or boat land landing and a steep path leads from here up to the bungalow. Accessible near, uh, by canoe is a nearby restaurant, Farley's, where one eats at tables on the lawn under a circle of lights and to the sound of tinkling mandolins, quite possibly a pun on and a fictionalized version of the real restaurant and night spot called The Farm or the Ross Fenton Farm. Nearer to Rosamond's bungalows, there's occasional foot traffic. The squire tells Rosamond that the public, the summer resort crowd, has a right of way up from the lake through the wood and that they make noise by singing, Along Came Ruth. Although there are no actual trespassers because he owns the land. Rosamond takes note of this because having the public walk by is consistent with her plans to operate her fortune telling and dream realization business. Perhaps the biggest clue occurs when the squire and Rosamond, excuse me, uh, perhaps the biggest clue occurs when the squire and Rosamond stop driving. They had reached a place, the novel says, now where the road became discouraged with life and reduced itself to a mere footpath, down which they walked to reach the lakefront bungalow. Much later in the novel, when Rosamond's cousin George looks over this area, he says to the squire, 
these lots look to me like they are ripe for development. So despite occasional boat and foot traffic, Rosamond's bungalow is somewhat isolated in the western part of a relatively undeveloped area that seems about to become developed. The novel's casual mentions of recent construction and potential development to the west of a train station is consistent with the historical development of the area west of the North Asbury Park train station. In a 1915 Asbury Park Chamber of Commerce booklet in an essay entitled Asbury Park's Real Estate Opportunities, City Commissioner George w. w. Pittenger wrote that, quote, out and beyond the original Asbury Park is a vast territory which is rapidly being developed. Only a few years past, a building movement started in West Fifth Avenue, just west of the North Asbury Station. This has grown until all the streets running west from the railroad line are being built up rapidly. And a new section further to the west still is rapidly developing. Near the end of the same booklet, the map of Asbury Park and vicinity is suggestive. In the upper right-hand corner, west of the Sunset Avenue Bridge, the map shows the early development of what is now Wanamasa, with eight north-south streets bisected by Sunset Avenue, and with Sunset Avenue shown as ending shortly after its intersection with Wicapeco. Here's a, a couple of years later, not 1915, but 1918. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, the last intersection is Sunset and Wicapeco. If the map is accurate, then the Squire and Rosamond parked the rolls near where Sunset Avenue ended and walked on a path less than half a mile, likely north and west, from there to Rosamond's lakefront bungalow. Point six. About the bungalow, Rosamond adds that from it, there's a heavenly view. The bungalow has six rooms and a fireplace, it has hot and cold water, stationary tubs, porcelain bath, electricity. Downstairs, we're told, quote, there was a big living room with a fireplace, a dining room with a heavenly bay window, and lavishly planned diamond-paned built-in closets. The kitchen was all blue with a gas range and tiling. Upstairs, there were three bedrooms, each duly fireplaced and a bath. The walls were all she could desire, rough and tinted, uh, end quote. There's a cellar with twists and turns to get to it. Rosamond arrives, uh, arranges to have some of the furniture from her great uncle's house to be delivered to her Wanalasset bungalow to furnish it. Outside, the bungalow is painted white and the veranda can be chilly on May evenings, but appears to have a swing set. Now, as odd as the gas and electricity details seem in a bungalow no later than 1915, the fictional details about the concrete construction and electric and gas utilities are historically consistent with real early 20th century home construction in this area. Uh, here again is from the Chamber of Commerce describing the gas service in and around Asbury Park, and also the electric service that was available in the area. Perhaps Whittemer is describing an imaginary bungalow interior, or maybe she's describing an actual bungalow interior she once visited. If it's a real structure and still standing, it would be an older two-story concrete structure, possibly covered with siding or stucco, on the lakefront and would have two or three chimneys, one of them possibly a double chimney. Point seven, John Squire's home is a half mile from the bungalow he sold to Rosamond. In chapter five, he's visited there by a recent Yale graduate named Richard Gerald, who Rosamond has seen canoeing on the lake and to whom she is attracted, later thinking of him as the white knight. However, the first time she sees Gerald, uh, Gerald is there not to see her at all, but to make Squire a business proposition that Squire should finance Gerald's new invention, a fantastically efficient and powerful turbine engine. When Squire asks if Gerald himself can provide any financing, 
Gerald says that he cannot because his wealth is tied up in a local property. Quote, I can't, I'm only out of Yale last June and my only available assets are a middle-sized hotel this relative left me near here down in the town. It's called the Mammoth, I suppose, because it's much smaller than the hotels on either side of it. And it's rather run down. I can't dispose of it because it hasn't a good clientage, what they call a following, I find, unquote. Gerald Leather later calls it a second-class hotel, 42 bedrooms, all modern improvements. But it's mentioned later that there are only six suites with a bath, meaning that everybody else shares communal bathrooms. Rosman later calls it a small brick hotel. There are long rows of closed houses between the hotel and the bungalow, suggesting that the hotel is nearer to the beach than to the train station. In subsequent discussions, Rosamond and Gerald discuss him run, running the hotel with Rosamond functioning as its manager in order to build a following and also to build Rosamond's fortune telling business so that he may flip the hotel to finance development of his new invention. Rosamond borrows the squire's housekeeper, Martha, and the three of them spend part of a day seeing what must be done to get the hotel running. Uh, that goes on for over 10 pages. Rosamond writes up in what she calls advertisementees, a new marketing plan in order to developing a following for the hotel. Quote, the mammoth, the young people's hotel, she wrote dashingly. We are noted for our cuisine and our home-like air of gaiety and comfort. The young men who frequent our hotel are unexceptionable in, in character. Prices below normal, unquote. Later, a variety of salespeople show up trying to sell Gerald fire extinguishers, types of food and drink, Rome deodorizers, and the like. Rosamond draws the line when there's a salesman of paper frills for lamb chops. The fact that the novel mentions details of hotel capacities, room charges, marketing, and running a hotel is curious. It suggests that such details were of interest to Whittemer. A few blocks down from the Monmouth Hotel, the same 1915 Chamber of Commerce publication lists another hotel, more modest, the Breakers at 103 Second Avenue on the corner with Ocean Avenue. This is now a parking lot across Second Avenue from the Stone Pony. The proprietor or manager was one A.D. Whittemer. This was, according to Peter Lucia, Margaret Whittemer's paternal aunt, who co-owned the hotel with Whittemer's mother. According to the Chamber of Commerce booklet, the hotel in 1915 was experiencing its third year under the same management, which suggests that the Whittemers acquired the hotel, formerly the Imperial, in 1912. The booklet also says that the Breakers is one of the best moderate, best priced moderate hotels on the beach and that it is well equipped, well run, comfortable hotel. As we saw in the photograph from across the street, it's a comparatively narrow structure in width twice the length of a 1915 automobile. As we will soon see, evidence indicates that Margaret Whittemer was staying at the Breakers Hotel while she was writing the novel, Why Not? Point A, the squire signs over a makeshift deed to Rosamond, tells her that her bungalow and his are connected by telephone, but that otherwise, quote, her nearest neighbors are a settlement of poor families, a little way before the rise here on the Ames Lane Road. The road name seems to have been fabricated. How far the rise is, is unspecified, but we may be able to infer a direction. Rosamond and the squire seem to have been traveling generally west on portions of what is now Sunset Avenue for a distance of about a mile and a half from the North Asbury Park train station area. This means that Rosamond's nearer neighbors nearest neighbors are not located near the train station, the real estate office, and the store. 
nor are these neighbors located between those buildings and the bungalow over the road they have just traveled, or else the squire would have mentioned the settlement as they passed through it and not later on. This means that the settlement to which the squire refers is west of the bungalow at a distance of less than a mile and a half. Otherwise, she could just go back to the area around the train station. The west direction is further implied because at the moment, the squire provides the information about this settlement. Rosamond comments on the lovely sunset and calls it an excellent pink and gold sunset. This may be a pun on the name of Sunset Avenue, but it certainly indicates the westerly direction she is looking. From that perspective, if the rise is west of their position, it may be the sandy ridge atop of which one may now find the Ocean Township Industrial Park. The settlement a little way before it may have been at the foot of that ridge near the now commercialized area on Sunset Avenue, just west of State Route 35. However, soon after Squire describes the nearest neighbors at the poor settlement, an orphan shows up in the bungalow. Her name is Alicia Loretta, known as Allie. She's familiar with the Squire who calls her Little Orphan Allie. She also seems familiar with the bungalow and the area around it because she walks to the bungalow barefoot, enters it and plays house uh, with the calm of long possession as the novel puts it. Familiarity with the area suggests that she is from the settlement of poor families on Ames Lane Road. On one occasion, Rosamond, suspecting a burglar, sees a figure climb in through her kitchen window. I have a, a longish quotation here. The entrance by the kitchen window was only a small barefoot girl in a blue woolen dress, which had been none too attractive in its best days and was torn and stained with constant wearing till now it was less a dress than a cover. The child moved about now that she had closed the window after her with the calm of long possession. She crossed into the living room with her tangled head held high and began to talk to herself in a slow and gracious voice. I think I'll wear my white frock with the rose pink sash today, auntie, she said, and my white shoes and stockings. Oh, my dolly, no, I ain't gonna take her with me. We're only going for a short ride in the Victroller, you know? Yes, thank you, dear auntie. No, I ain't tired. I've only practiced my piano lessons a little bit a while and, and done some scrubbing out for poor Miss Simmons down the road a piece. Yes, it was kind of me. You know you says we ought to be kind to the poor. For the next several dozen pages, we are treated to what amounts to a linguistic time capsule. Whittemer's written depiction of how a poor uneducated orphan from Ocean Township might have talked in 1915. Just in the excerpt I just performed for you, Alicia tends to drop terminal consonants like going. She uses contractions. She pronounces terminal vowels with an R like piano and to use regionalisms. Phrases like a little bit a while, scrubbing out and down the road a piece. Because this is a real local author attempting to uh, depict a fictional local character's speech patterns, quite apart from the novel's literary merit, the novel suggests how some real people might have spoken over a century ago in Ocean Township. Little Alicia even helps to confirm the time frame provided earlier by the Squire's Rolls Royce, while Allie is confused about what a Victrola is, the fact that she uses the word at all helps us to narrow the chronological range of the novel setting. The Victrola was first introduced in 1906, the same year as the Rolls Royce. So chronologically, the novel setting is likely to be no earlier than 1906 and no later than 1915. Point nine and last. In the passage I just read, Allie is in Rosamond's bungalow and refers to the location of Miss Simmons' house as 
down the road a piece. Much later in the novel, when Squire is looking for Ali and talking to Rosamond in her bungalow, he uses the same preposition in reference to the location of Miss Simmons' house. We've been, quote, we've been down the road to Miss Simmons. Because the direction is down from Rosamond's bungalow, down could mean downhill or in some direction other than the east-west road on which they came from the train station, down most likely meaning south. In Squire's statement to Rosamond, he says, we've been down the road to Miss Simmons and up the road in the other direction for three miles. So whatever road this is, it is not far from the intersection of Sunset and Wikipeco. It goes south for some distance and it goes north, north for three miles. Of local north-south roads of the era, Logan Road, further west, would have been closer to the poor community from which Ali may have come, to the west of the bungalow. Logan Road extended south of Sunset and north for a considerable distance as a kind of precursor to State Route 35, down or south Logan Road from Sunset Avenue might have been to the settlement called Logantown. In this depiction that's not to scale, you can see at the very bottom, the North Asbury Park train station, then extending um, from that, Sunset Avenue, which crosses a bridge and then goes into Wanamasa. Here's Logantown Road. And there's an elevation in the distance that is said to be 100 feet above sea level. These 11 points of similarity, of which I've mentioned only nine, between the fictional setting of Why Not and the real geography of the area account for most of the novel's details pertaining to setting, except for a few late passing references to a generic country club. The points of similarity suggest that Whittemer was fictionalizing real locations. This was actually spotted by at least one book reviewer at the time. In the September 9th, 1915 issue of an obscure periodical entitled Bookseller, News Dealer, and Stationer, an anonymous reviewer wrote, quote, the situation of the book is near Wanamasa on Deal Lake near Allenhurst. The reviewer's wording does not say that the setting is based on a real place, as we might say, but seems to take a further step and imply that the setting is a real place. Thus, at least some readers, especially local ones, were likely to have spotted that Whittemer was fictionalizing real world local geography. Part two, The Dream Lady, the film adaptation. Three years after the novel's publication, it was adapted into a silent film, The Dream Lady, released by Universal in 1918. Advanced still photos from the film appeared in train, trade magazines, promotions, and reviews of the film. And some of these photos showed external scenes that resemble what Moana Massa might have looked like at the time. A body of calm water, possibly Deal Lake, little development with low hills and many trees, especially pines. Here's another one showing Rosamond and the squire. The film's director and producer, Elsie Jane Wilson, was among the first American female silent film directors. The Dream Lady was among 13 films she produced and directed. She was not alone. For a few years in the late 19 teens, Universal Studios hired several female directors to produce films intended to appeal, appeal to female audiences. Unfortunately, after only a few years, by 1920, Universal had deemed this market insufficient and the female directors were let go 
or took on other roles in the industry. Wilson herself went on to assist her husband, director Rupert Julian. For many years, the Dream Lady silent film existed in only one copy in an archive of, in France and was unavailable to the public. Fortunately, a few years ago, the Library of Congress began a major restoration initiative intended to preserve these early films by female directors. The result of that is a collection, Pioneers, First Women Filmmakers, now available from Kino Lorber in DVD and Blu-ray. Wilson's The Dream Lady is included. The film has been shown on TCM.com, on TCM, and TCM.com has posted online a few clips. The hope was that the film would confirm what the still photos had suggested, that the novel set in the area had actually been filmed there. Unfortunately, this was not the case. The Dream Lady was not filmed on location in New Jersey. Universal had moved its operations to California's, California a few years prior, and the restored version of the film confirms this. In the film, scenes outside and inside the bungalow are clearly shot in a studio. Some exterior landscape shots do depict geography similar to that found around Deal Lake, but others depict geography totally unlike coastal New Jersey, but consistent with California. Large boulders interrupting steep streams, stock footage of broad expanses of rolling grassy hills with tall mountains in the background. Perhaps worse yet, among other novel scenes, the film omits Rosamund's arrival by train and her trip to Wanalasa. In fact, the film mentions none of the specific geographical locations that the novel does. It does not mention the nearby seaside town, nor does it mention Wanalasa by name, or even that the setting is in New Jersey. As charming and historically significant as the film is, by removing all geographical references, it sheds no light on local history. And in that respect is something of a dead end. Part three, upside down and backwards. One of the curiosities about Margaret Whitmer is that she wrote and said very little about Asbury Park beyond her three books, 1915, 1920, 1923, set in fictionalized versions of Asbury Park. Her 1964 memoir, Golden Friends I Had, skips entirely over her childhood and early life in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and fast forwards to the 1920s in New York, by which time she had left behind Asbury Park, both residentially and as a literary inspiration. Based on the three published books, which are fiction, one can only obliquely speculate what her early life might have been like and what she might have thought of it looking back at it. Fortunately, beyond the pub published works, there's another source of information about her Asbury Park years. In her old age, Margaret Whitmer was living in upstate New York in Gloversville. Around 1963, she was approached by Syracuse University regarding disposition of her papers, which Syracuse eventually acquired, processed, and made available to researchers, approximately seven linear feet of materials. However, the university also took correspondence that Whitmer evidently deemed sensitive, and that was subsequently withdrawn from Syracuse and returned to her in 1965. Nevertheless, Syracuse is the major repository of her papers and has substantial holdings of her works, files, manuscripts, and scrapbooks. So I consulted Syracuse's description of the Margaret Whitmer papers, which indicated some boxes of materials that contained, quote, autobiographical and biographical writings. Intrigued, I traveled to Syracuse to the Bird Library and to its Special Collections Research Center, where my goal was to look at these autobiographical writings, which I hope would shed light on her early works set in fictionalized versions of Asbury Park and adjoining communities. But the autobiographical writings seem to have been mislabeled. They appeared to be craft typescripts of chapters of her post Asbury memoir, Golden Friends I Had, another dead end. However, nearing the end of my second day at Syracuse, I started to look at her scrapbooks. 
Syracuse has at least three of them, two of them folio sized, which is about the size of an open laptop computer, and one of them at least double folio sized, quite enormous. She seemed to have reused previously used ledgers. Where she obtained these ledgers, I could not determine and do not know, but I speculate they may have been church ledgers she may have acquired after the deaths of her father and grandfather, who were both ministers. Pasted on top of the church ledger pages is a second layer, the scrapbook, consisting of a variety of materials, typescripts and printed copies of some of her works, ads and promotional materials for her books, features and interviews, and book reviews she clipped herself and received from clipping services. At least early in her life, she was quite an avid scrapbooker. The first two scrapbooks were pasted full of clippings and solidly pasted, but the third scrapbook is not. The pasting seemed to have stopped sometime in the mid-1920s, with many dozens of clippings placed loosely in the scrapbook, evidently because there was insufficient time to keep up with all the pasting. In the first two scrapbooks, because Whittemer pasted in clippings as she went sequentially through the pages of the ledger from front to back, one may determine approximate dates of when a page had been pasted to completion. In terms of why not, the scrapbook included ads promoting the novel, and reviews of it, among other things. And since the clippings included either handwritten dates or publication dates provided by the clipping service, turning pages in the scrapbook was like proceeding through time a couple of weeks per page. But near the end of a scrapbook, I noticed a strange feature, mainly along the right sides and bottoms of the scrapbook pages, handwriting. This was not the clerical notation of names and numbers that had previously appeared in the first pages of the scrapbook as the church ledger. This handwriting was in a different hand in what looked like sentences, but written upside down. Cautiously, I rotated the ledger 180 degrees so that it was upside down and the handwritten text right side up at what was now the top of the page, a partial handwritten sentence appeared with a familiar name, Rosamond. Several pages near the end of the scrapbook had such handwriting. Going upside down and backwards through the scrapbook, I next found the page that appears on the slides which stood out to me because the handwriting included the phrase Little Orphan Alley. Okay, if you notice where the dark clippings are, I'm going to now flip this page over. And if we zoom in at the top, you will see Little Orphan Alley's name to the right of the zoom in. I deciphered and transcribed what I thought I saw, which was challenging because the handwriting was partially obscured by upside down clippings in the way. Then in my digital copy of the novel, Why Not? I searched for the word string, Little Orphan Alley, which appears on page 50 in the novel. The upside down and backwards handwriting matched almost exactly the printed text of the novel, the main difference being lack of paragraphing in the manuscript. I repeated this process a half dozen times and found in each case, the observable handwriting in the scrapbook matched the text of the, perf of the published novel. I reported my findings to Syracuse's Special Collections Research Center which had never even noticed the manuscript. Hidden partly under the clippings, upside down and starting backwards from the end of the ledger is Whittemer's manuscript, two pages of notes and approximately the first 53 published pages of the novel, Why Not? 
Part four, speculations. The note scrapbook contains other information that sheds light on the composition process of why not. Whittemer appears to have started work on Why Not in early 1915. Her first novel, The Rose Garden Husband, was published in March 1915. A few months later in June, a clipping, evidently from an Asbury Park paper, says, she is at present at the Breakers on Second Avenue, where she is engaged in writing another novel which will appear in the early fall. The Breakers was her aunt's hotel at 2nd and Ocean Avenues in Asbury Park. The Another Novel is Why Not, which was indeed published in the early fall on September 14th, 1915. This clipping may account for several things. In the novel, one of the settings is a seaside resort hotel, the Mammoth, featured for at least a dozen pages, the fictional hotel owned by Richard Gerald. Rosamond helps him to promote the hotel so it can generate enough profit to fund his invention. While it's possible that this hotel is made up or based on some other hotel, Whittemer was standing, uh, was staying at her aunt's hotel, The Breakers, at the time she was writing the novel, and quite possibly at the same time she was writing the scenes set in and around in a, a hotel. The clipping also provides a practical reason why Whittemer drafted the manuscript in a ledger book. She was staying in an unair conditioned hotel across Ocean Avenue from the beach in the summertime when the windows might be open and the ledger paper is bound into the book and could not blow away. The same clipping says that Whittemer was working on the novel in June 1915 and the novel was published in September 1915. At some point, she stopped writing by hand in the ledger. I speculate that this might have been because of her publisher's impending deadline. With a manuscript with abbreviations for names and no paragraphing, the manuscript would have needed to have been rewritten or typed for the book's printer to know what to do. Whittemer may have switched from manuscript to typescript to expedite. The scrapbook may also account for another feature of the novel, the character Alicia Loretta, the little orphan called Allie. Here, two scrapbook pages from the time show Whittemer's interest in the welfare of children. First, by the fall of 1914, a scrapbook page containing two items, a newspaper clipping and an invitation, show that Margaret Whittemer read some of her poetry at a Child's Welfare Association gathering at Asbury Park's Marlboro Hotel on Grand Avenue. Second, on a later page containing a clipping dating, dated June 1916, a newspaper article from what appears to be an Asbury Park newspaper entitled Whittemer's Enter Settlement Work. The article focuses on Whittemer's brother Kenneth's work for the Bowling Green Neighborhood Association in New York City but notes that Margaret is also interested with her brother. Later in that article, she comments on how she came to be interested in working with children. Quote, when my brother dumped a little Syrian baby on my lap to be chaperoned at Asbury Park last summer, I began to care about these things through her. And once you start at this work, it gets you. You don't keep away from it. For a newspaper article on a scrapbook page dated June 1916, Last summer would have been the summer of 1915, in at least June of which Whittemer was writing at her aunt's Asbury Park Hotel. In an ironic juxtaposition, this newspaper article quoting Whittemer is pasted on top of what appears to be page 10 of the handwritten manuscript of Why Not? So, at the same time period that Whittemer was writing the novel featuring Little Orphan Alley, she had two local experiences pertaining to the welfare of children. Now, my research is ongoing into why not and into the relationship between Margaret Whittemer's life and times and her fictionalization of local communities. However, this presentation must pause here for now. I will be speaking about Whittemer again later this month in person for the Asbury Park Historical Society and I hope to see some of you there at the Stephen Crane House. In the meantime, I thank you for your interest and kind attention, 
and welcome your questions and comments. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. That was again so exciting to uh, to see her handwriting under there and realize what that was. It, it 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 really was. I had to stand up and pace around a little bit because I just I could not believe what I had, had seen. Uh, finding the manuscript, I didn't expect to find the manuscript, mm -hmm. and, and uh, um, you know it's pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And that was just, um, I mean, she was being practical by pasting over it. You know, it was published, so she didn't care, right? Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a common practice back then, too, to turn basically one ledger or one journal into two by flipping it over and starting from the back, like working your way in from both sides, just like a practical way to conserve paper. Um, absolutely. Okay. And I, I think the fact that she was writing uh, in a hotel that probably had the windows open, uh, made a ledger a very practical choice mm -hmm. uh, in that she didn't have to worry about pages blowing away. Yeah. I, I think too that um, it's possible that the format of the paper helped her to write. I say that she didn't have to change pa uh, sheets of paper in a typewriter uh, she didn't have to pick up new pieces of paper. The pieces of paper she had were two to three times the size of a normal piece of paper. So she could just write and write and write. And she did. Oh, so it's one of the big scrapbooks then. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I would say folio sized. Yeah. So if you picture, if you have a laptop computer and you open it up, uh, that's how, how the size of maybe one sheet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Hmm, I think everybody's just sort of digesting it. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, I liked um, what you noted about the ability to hear the speech patterns. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, one, one of the things that many American authors were doing after the Civil War were, was writing in literary dialect. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which consists really of, of two features. One is spelling words the way they sound, uh, which is called phonemic orthography. And then the other is use of regionalisms. So an example, let's say in New Jersey, is, is, the, is the beverage pronounced coffee or coffee? Right. Uh, chocolate <laughs> or chocolate? Uh, how, how the vowel is pronounced indicates what area of the state you are from. Mm -hmm. uh, an example of a regionalism would be the term for a roll split down the middle with lunch meat, cheese, lettuce, tomato, and dressing. Is it a sub or is it a hoagie? Uh, yes. <laughs> and then, of course, there is the perennial central New Jersey favorite of Taylor ham versus pork roll. And of course, anyone from this area knows that it's pork roll. Of course. <laughs> yeah, that could, that could start a fight, actually. Um, so we have somebody asking, she says, as a writer yourself, do you feel a special connection to Ms. Widmer? Uh, I, I do. I, I think it's important to realize that while you could draw inspiration as a writer um, from famous people and famous events in faraway places, often it's easiest and best to just write about the world that's right under your nose. And I, I think that was what Margaret Whittemer was doing. She was a keen observer of life around her and uh, was able to elevate that to the level of the imagination. Uh, you know, the idea that she's writing about a few square mile area, and then this ends up being made into a nationally distributed silent film. Uh, for me, that's amazing. Um, so, so yes, I, the the focus on uh, maybe the most difficult thing is to observe what's right in front of you. Uh, Lois is asking. Uh, she says she lives in Wanamasa and she recognized some of the places that were described. And did you kind of go through and walk those paths? 
Well, the paths are no longer there. They, they've all been replaced by paved streets and, um, and alleyways. Uh, but I have driven through and walked through some areas of the neighborhood to try and make some uh, determinations about that. I've also checked with uh, Ocean Township. Uh, they have some records of the very few houses that were constructed in Ocean Township prior to 1920. And in a previous version of this talk, I actually had a couple from Wanamasa who believed that maybe they were living in the dream lady's house. Mm -hmm. It didn't quite fit the description, but I love the enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And so they also went looking for it. Uh, as I said, it would be two, if it's still standing, two stories made out of concrete with a basement and fireplaces. Um, so Lois, if, if you have that as your house, you'd be very fortunate. <laughs> Um, Faith is asking if the bungalow is near where the Sunset Landing restaurant is. Um, I'm not sure if I know where that restaurant is. Yeah, I don't think uh, I... I know what's described in the novel is a place that seems uh, consistent with a restaurant that was in that general area called the Farm or the Ross Fenton Farm. Uh, the township of Ocean. Um, uh, website on Wanamasa contains some uh, old uh, postcards of uh, the farm or the Ross Fenton farm. So it was a very popular place for people to go at the turn of the last century. Yeah, that's always a great uh, source of images is old postcards. Um, so, uh, Carol's asking how Whittemer got published. Did she have an agent? Um, she did not. Uh, she started writing and publishing very early. Some of her first publications were actually for a children's magazine based in uh, Newark called St. Nicholas Magazine. And much of her early writing uh, was poetry. So I think she established herself publishing in small magazines and networking and, and reading her poems and then worked her way into or up to fiction. Um, so she had only published one novel before this uh, called The Rose Garden Husband, in which the main character is a librarian. Um, one clipping says that she wrote the novel in Asbury Park. And it was a bestseller. Um, and besides that, it, the film rights were required. So in a way, what happened was she got very fortunate in terms of writing her first novel. And its sales and the film rights then ensured that there was a, a steady market for her fiction uh, in following years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her work was so varied from the novels to the children's stuff to the poetry. It was great. Yeah, she did romance novels. She, she was interested in historical fiction as well. She tried her hand at a number of different things. I have not yet found that she tried to write a Western, uh, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for tonight. It was wonderful. And I can't wait to see the dream lady now. I'm going to go on a canopy at the library and, and rent it. Yeah, I, it, it's an enjoyable film. Again, I, I, I am tempered a, a bit because it's devoid of any local references, uh, but it's great to see Margaret Whitmer's name up on the screen. It gives you an idea of how much of celebrity she was around 1915, 1916, 1917, thereabouts. Her credit as a uh, And then winning the Pulitzer. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. I appreciate all of the questions. Um, and if you have others, please email me uh, at the university. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, Dana. And I hope everyone has a pleasant evening. Thanks. You too. All right. Good night, everyone.